This is my father's world Into my listening ear All nature sings and round me rings The music of the spheres This is my father's world I rest me in the thought Of rocks and trees, of skies and seas His hand the wonders wrought Sunday after Easter and Mother's Day. So happy Mother's Day to, uh, to, to moms. You guys are great. And so here's what we want to do in the beginning. I want to read, um, read from a, uh, an article that was published some time ago. Um, there was actually the introduction to a song that was released by a woman uh, named Caroline Cobb. Um, entitled The Wonder. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to read a portion of this, and then I want to share with you a few lines from the song as well. So, um, so, so bear with me here in the beginning as we, as we honor moms, okay? Um, this, is, uh, this is her writing on the song that she wrote. Being a mom of three young kids has felt a bit like being thrown into a pressure cooker. The heat and stress of my everyday caused sin patterns that had probably always been there to bubble up to the surface again and again. I struggled with losing my temper, with my words coming out in anger, and then I struggled with the subsequent shame. Frustrated with myself that I'd fallen short yet again and failed my kids who I loved. Next, I would pull myself up by my bootstraps, determined to try harder to do better. But inevitably, in a high-stress moment, my sin would spill out again. In this season of failing and falling, God in His kindness helped me rediscover the beauty of the gospel. I had believed it all along, but I was functioning in motherhood as if it were not true. As I came to the end of myself and to the place of acknowledging my utter spiritual poverty, I found that God was carrying me to the foot of the cross. He pointed me back to the good news. 
I could never achieve or deserve. It was as if he took my face tenderly in his hands, looked me in the eye with love, and said, Don't you see, this is why I sent my son. As a mom, I still fail every day, and more often than I'd like to admit. But like the snake-bitten Israelites of Numbers 21, God invites me not to stare at my own snake bites and sin, but to behold the brazen serpent lifted high on my behalf. In the gospel, he invites me to run to the wonder of the cross, rather than wallowing in my shame or striving to make the grade as a mom. I can ask my kids for forgiveness and then point them not to a perfect mom, but a perfect Savior. And I do it again and again because we never outgrow the gospel. Here are a few lines from Cook's song entitled The Wonder. Little fingers, they run through my hair, a tiny head on my shoulder. When you reach for my hand just to know I'm there, the things I'll miss when you're older. But in the rush of the day, how I turn away, how I forget the wonder. I forget the grace and the giving of thanks for the weight of the love that I'm under. When my temper is short and the day is long and my words come out in anger, and I tell you I'm sorry, but the moment's gone. I'm so heavy with my failure. But let me tell you, darling, where your mama, she is running to the cross Oh, what a wonder. All my love, just a shadow pointing onto the hallowed, to what's deeper, wider, longer. When my hair is gray and my words get slow and my days are almost over, and I whisper to you how I love you so, I hope you never had to wonder. And you know, my child, you've never been only mine, though I wish I could hold you longer, though I leave you, He is near. He will wipe away your tears. You're so loved by God the Father. Oh, oh, the wonder. And so to all the moms, struggling moms, spiritual moms, longing moms, and to the confused and hurting today because mom isn't here, whether she's absent, absentee, or passed on, know that you are loved and that you are cared for by a God who loves and redeems the family through the cross of Jesus. To the moms of Christ the King, keep seeking Jesus, investing in your children and this community for the glory of Christ and our good. Let's stand together and let's read from Psalm 98 as we celebrate the gospel and all of the ways that it so transforms every human relationship and institution and person. O sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with lyre, with the lyre and the sound of melody. With trumpets and the sound of the horn, make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills sing for joy together before the Lord. For he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. This is God's word. Thanks be to him for it. Let's pray together. Father, we are grateful for um, today in which we are able to come and celebrate again the good news of the gospel that is the resurrection of our King Jesus as the one who has purchased us, as the one who is redeeming creation, and the one who is committed to glorifying you in and through all things. May we adopt this same desire and posture in and for our lives. We are grateful for the good gifts that you give us. We are grateful for moms who love us and point us to the hope of the gospel and where our moms fall short. We are grateful that you are a father who is able to sustain us, 
and to meet us in our need with great love and affection. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. 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 Uh, we're going to start by singing How Firm Our Foundation this morning. Creed, if you would follow along with me as I read. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Let's continue to sing.
from 1 John uh, of this command to love one another. We're going to continue in that same vein of thought this morning. I'm going to read from John, uh, 1 John chapter 5, uh, the first six verses, and then I'm going to read a prayer of confession that we're actually going to finish together. So I'll start it, and then all of us will uh, we'll finish out the prayer together. Um, in 1 John chapter 5, beginning in verse 1, this is the word of the Lord. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. God of everlasting love, we confess that we have been unfaithful to our covenant with you and with one another. We have worshipped other gods, money, power, greed, and convenience. We have served our own self-interest instead of serving only you and your people. We have not loved our neighbor as you have commanded, nor have we li rightly loved ourselves. Forgive us, gracious God, and bring us back into the fullness of our covenant with you and one another. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Uh, we're going to sing Grace Alone. and. Uh, it was kind of hinted at through what we just read from John, and we've already confirmed it in the Apostles' Creed. But we're going to sing of how the Father uh, calls us and, uh, and sets us apart, and then Christ redeems us through the cross. And the Spirit um, awakens our hearts to the reality of the gospel and then enables us to, uh, to live out the gospel.
44 through 48. While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed, because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, Can anyone withhold water for baptism, baptizing these people? who have received the Holy Spirit, just as we have, and he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to remain for some days. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you for um, just your grace and your love and your mercy that you've poured out to us through Christ. And we're thankful for the work of the gospel in our hearts. Um, we're just thankful that we can celebrate um, Christ um, in our place. And I just pray now for... Um, as we look to your word, that you would just still our hearts, that we would be focused on Christ and the work that he's done, um, and that we would be ever thankful for the forgiveness of sins. And I just pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You guys can have a seat. And um, yeah, so good to see you all. Um, hey, open up, if you would, to... Uh, Luke chapter 13, okay? We're going to be in Luke chapter 13 beginning today, and so uh, I want to invite you to open up there. As you do, um, I, uh, I want to just remind us of a few points um, that I think, uh, again, are just helpful in um, kind of knowing what's going on in the life of our church. Um, we've got two weeks left that we're going to be taking registration for our next round of membership here at Christ the King. So I told First Service, uh, and I'll tell you guys this as well, that... Um, if, uh, if you're considering church membership or if you're unfamiliar with church membership or even covenantal church membership like we practice here at Christ the King, I want to invite you to come and to be a part of, uh, of exploring membership with us. Um, this is uh, in no way necessarily a commitment um, at the first meeting, right, to, uh, to kind of bring about finalization or resolution to the process, but it is an invitation to come and to talk about what it means to be a church member. Um, if you have friends who are, for one reason or another, potentially, um, you know, hostile towards the idea of church membership or hesitant of the idea of church membership, then uh, I would totally invite you to invite them to come and discuss this with us. I think it's going to be a, a ton of fun. And so, like I said, two weeks left to register for that. And then once we um, kind of like go through these next couple weeks, someone will reach out and, uh, and let you know when and where we will be meeting. So um, make sure that you fill that out. And uh, again, that'll be super helpful. Again, uh, secondly, We've got book club that's ongoing on Monday evenings at 7 o'clock over here in this kind of front area of our, of our neighboring space. And so um, if you want to come and be a part of a conversation through the Wisdom Pyramid, uh, we want to invite you to, to do that. Don't feel like you've had to have read all the book to be a part of the conversation. Um, you certainly don't have to have done that. So uh, make plans to, to come if you'd like to, uh, to be a part of that. And then uh, lastly, and we'll remind you guys this at the end as well, if you're a mom and you didn't get one of the Mother's Day gifts that we have for you, make sure that you grab, um, you grab one of those before you leave. Here we go. Luke chapter 13, beginning in verse 1. Uh, I'm going to perhaps provide a little bit of commentary as we work our way through this section, um, just so that we don't trip all over some questions that we might have before we kind of get to answering those questions. Okay, so um, if you're with me there in Luke chapter 13, say amen. 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 Here we go. There were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans, him being Jesus. There's this ongoing discourse and dialogue between Jesus and this group that is gathered. About the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Verse 4. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them. Do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And so here's what Jesus has done, and we're going to explore this as we begin our time together today. He's, he's engaging in conversation around these events that would have been familiar to his original audience 
questions that are presented by his audience in light of his teaching at the conclusion of Luke 12. Okay, so that may have been a little a lot for some of us, but we're going to kind of work our way through this in just a moment. I just want you to kind of know if you're sitting here and you're going, what in the world is going on? Um, you're not alone, probably. Okay, so don't be like ashamed. Um, but also just hang with me because we're going to get to it. Verse 6. And he told them this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Verse 7. And he said to the vine dresser, Look, for three years now I've come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Therefore, cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and put on manure. Verse 9. Then, if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. This is God's word. Thanks be to him for it. Let's pray together. Lord, we pray that as we come to your word in a posture of humility today, that you would give us insight and understanding to all that this text has to say about who we are, about who you are, and about how the gospel is such good news in remedying our natural condition. We are grateful for the hope of the resurrection and the sufficiency of Christ's death. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. So we are, um, we're coming out of a two-month walk through the 12th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, <laughs> where Jesus spends a considerable amount of time constructing an explanation and expectation for Christian life. That uh, to those who confess the lordship of Jesus and his supremacy in creation, Jesus' instruction is clear. Guard your heart against insincerity and hypocrisy, moving out towards others in gospel boldness, leaning on the Spirit of God for strength. This is from uh, the follower of, uh, this is, is a, a formation for the follower of Christ of our expectation of criticism and marginalization from others in the world. Jesus' teaching in chapter 12 teaches the follower of, of Jesus this, right? Don't be surprised and don't give yourself to the desires of one's natural condition. Know that you will experience marginalization. Know that you will experience trouble and difficulty and hardship in this life. And as you go about these experiences, be on guard against certain marks. Covetousness and materialism. As these things will what? They will pull you. As followers of Jesus, the instruction has been quite clear. Make a concentrated effort to pursue richness in God, resting in his faithfulness and the reliability of his world, his word. Know this, know that there will be division and there will be tension that we feel in us and around us. Chapter 12 reminds us that Jesus is always committed to the truth that we need as opposed to the truth that we always want. As he challenges inconsistencies. As he challenges inconsistencies resulting in renewed, expressed reliance and confidence in our great King. Our failures to love God and to live out obedience to his word are drawn out through this discourse in Luke chapter 12. This reality that we've spoken about even already together this morning. We are reminded of our disobedience and we are pointed towards the hope of Christ's work on the cross and his resurrection from the dead to cover us in his faithfulness. This is the good news of the gospel. 
We are encouraged to, to dig up and to identify familiar points of, of confidence for righteousness, justification, and joy, and to see these things deconstructed by the good news of Christ's work on the cross and his victory over death, which just so happens to secure for you and I forgiveness of sin through faith, an eternal community with God as he takes our doubt and debt before providing us with life. The message of the conclusion of chapter 12 is universal and individualistic guilt. It is the condition of natural man that is the human state in light of the rebellion of Adam recorded in Genesis chapter 3. How that impacts our lives, how that impacts our hearts, how that impacts our world. On a local and on a global level. It's a challenge to the heart of man, and it's a challenge to our individual hearts. And so what Jesus has been saying and speaking on in Luke chapter 12 challenges the human race, but it doesn't do so only in this broad, lateral, sweeping form, though it certainly does that, but it narrows in on the individual's heart. It narrows in on my heart and on your heart as well. As we begin chapter 13, we find Jesus discussing two local examples of tragedy. Presented by what I understand to be, and this is so important, opponents to this idea of total lateral guilt and sin in an effort to minimize their own depravity. Did that make sense what we just said there? This is what we are going to see by way of Jesus' discussion around these two local examples of tragedy, which is recorded here in the beginning for us. The first is presented by this group that would identify themselves clearly as opponents to the idea of lateral total guilt and sin in an effort to minimize their own depravity. To distance themselves from the type of, of bold, rotting rebellion and death that brings the type of judgment from God that Jesus has been most recently talking about. This is a practice that we ourselves are familiar with. Let's think of it this way, right? The, the systematic categorization of sin that results in a comfortable distance being established from our own hearts or practices and those that God is actually concerned with. Surely God is not as interested in me and my sin and my failure and my disobedience and my rebellion as he is this particular individual or group whose sin seems to be much more heinous than mine. This is the thought that's circulating here as we begin Luke chapter 13. And it's reflected by way of the question that is presented in verse 1. There were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And so there are those who have been listening in on the teaching of Jesus, which again, think most recently centered on sin and judgment, who bring up this this event that seemed to have, have included a number of Galileans. Best we know, the events referred to here occurred at Passover in the temple. And that these who are referenced were likely pilgrims who had traveled down for the festival. Apparently, Pilate believed these Galileans to be a part of some sort of mischievous activity. 
leading him to send guards to confront them during the time of sacrifice before practicing more force that then would have resulted in the drawing of swords and the pooling of blood that would have run down into the river, mixing in the waters with the blood from the goats and the lambs that had been offered as Sacrifice, call it a cautionary tale, call it the record of an escalated series of events that resulted in the shedding of blood. Whatever you want to call it, this is what's being referenced here. And a historical event that the original audience would have been familiar with. An event that would have been well known, similar in familiarity as what we might no, as the Boston Tea Party or the events in 1970 on the campus at Kent State. These events that spoke to an audience in a particular way and communicated a, a clear message. We're going to become around the why behind their question in just a moment. You have the Galileans and then you have those whom the tower fell on. What do we need to know, not so much about this sequence of events, but the why behind the question that is presented? Well, the Jewish people held rigidly to the idea that one's misfortune, hear this, was a result of sin. Not so much sin in the world, that is to say that we live in a broken world and therefore awful and, and evil things happen, but sin in a person's life. There are two great examples of this line of thought playing itself out. The first, in the Old Testament, in the life of Job, and second, a recorded conversation between Jesus and his disciples in the New Testament recorded in John chapter 9. Okay, so let's read this together. I want to take us to John chapter 9 for a moment. We're going to read uh, verses 1 through 3. And I think what this is going to do is solidify for us an understanding of the question that is being presented in light of cultural expectation. Okay, In John chapter 9, beginning in verse 1, this is a familiar story. Jesus is on, uh, let's call it a walkabout with his disciples. Okay, He's walking through uh, the city. And as he is walking with his disciples, they pass by a man who has been blind from birth, verse 1. And as they do, the disciples of Jesus turn their attention to their teacher and they ask him, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind? This is the, the idea, right, that there is this connection between one's personal sin and the difficulty or consequence that they are left to experience in their life. We see this man's condition, right? It is, it is less than ideal. And so our question, the question from the disciples towards Jesus is who sinned here to bring all of this about? They're not centering on sin that exists as a result of Adam's rebellion. They are centering on an individual's action that has brought about this observable consequence. This is Jesus' response. It was not that this man sinned or his parents. And so there's this severing of the connection that the Jewish people held so rigidly to. This has nothing to do with sin by this man or his parents. But all of this is that the works of God might be displayed in him. And so not only is it that you can't necessarily connect this man's condition with sin in him or around him. But there are righteous purposes in hardship. This is it's just an aside to what we're seeing here in John chapter 9. Now, certainly, I think that we would agree that there is a level of insensitivity here <laughs> from the disciples in asking the question, though a lot of it is cultural, and so we can't necessarily connect with that in the same way. What I think you and I need to be careful of is to not adopt some type of moral high ground as we, as we observe from an outsider's perspective, this dialogue recorded for us here without understanding opportunity for contemporary application. 
the thought in each instance, whether it be here in John chapter 9 or recorded here in Luke chapter 13, or as we contextualize it here in 2021, sounds very much like that of karma. An idea that is easily adopted even by Christians. This concept that that sin results in trouble, one's personal sin, one's individual sin results in trouble, while moral or, or ethical acts, appropriate moral or ethical acts, bring about blessing. There are, of course, certain logical issues with this thought from a Christ-centered perspective. Primarily among them, the holiness of Jesus coupled with the grotesque nature that is the experience of the cross. Certainly none has been more righteous than our crucified and resurrected King who gave himself in perfect obedience to the instruction of the Lord walking in obedience to his word and expectation, only then to be nailed to a tree. Not only that, but the great trouble and trial that has accompanied the follower of Jesus since the genesis of the church. If there is this unbreakable cord tethering sin and struggle, If there is this cord that that brings together holiness and wholeness from a worldly perspective, then we are left with a mountain of confusion before us as we consider both local and global atrocities. How do we make sense of the brokenness that we witness in us and observe all around us from the devastation left in the wake of tornadoes like those in Noonan just a few months ago, Franklin, and most recently Atlanta, to the difficulty of, of, a, of, a, of a health diagnosis, persistent mental and emotional stress and strain, chronic pain, relational rift, the list could go on and on and on. The implication as it relates to the Galileans, whose life is, at best, made significantly more difficult for the foreseeable future, and perhaps even cut short altogether at the hands of these Roman officials, and then later the victims of this infrastructure failure, is that these things happened because of some degree of sin in their lives that would seem to transcend the individual sins of those represented and perhaps even those speaking. This is the issue of Luke chapter 13. You have one group in light of the teaching on judgment from Jesus recorded at the end of chapter 12 who are pointing to these, to these tragic events and leveraging them as as evidence of sin in the life of individuals that is worthy of the type of judgment that Jesus has been talking about most recently. Right? Clearly, there are categories of sin, Jesus, right? Because we maintain health and, and prosperity in our current context while we're able to reflect back on these stories around the Galileans who were slain in the temple. Right? How deeply rooted must their sin have been to become the objects of, of such a tragic event. There's an effort on behalf of those that are engaged in dialogue with Jesus to minimize their sin and guilt, and consequently the judgment that they find themselves under, which I would imagine many of them, in light of the teaching of Jesus, believe to either be unjust or non-existent. And what they feel like they themselves deserve. Jesus refutes this idea in his response. And so let's turn our attention to the response of Jesus in light of an understanding of these events. And I believe what they're, what they're really driving towards, an effort to, to separate themselves, to elevate themselves. Jesus says this. 
He says, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? Or is this what you believe, that their sin is more, more obvious and more heinous and more worthy of judgment than any of the other Galileans? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Verse 4, second event. Or those 18 on whom the Tower of Siloam fell and killed them. Do you think that they were worse offenders than the others who lived in Jerusalem? That they themselves were, were, were the ones who were subject and object of the judgment of God as though their sin set them apart in this unique way? No, Jesus says, verse 5. I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Jesus' explanation to the question he has asked again takes the form of a warning. And it's a warning that we need to hear. Okay? So let's just, let's just lean in together and let's, let's learn from the teaching of Jesus. If you maintain your pursuit of earthly kingdom, which was so central to the message of Luke chapter 12, and is going to prove to be important and essential for our understanding of kingdom over, over coming weeks, as Jesus is going to begin to speak in parable about the kingdom in these really beautiful and profound ways. If you maintain your pursuit of, of earthly kingdom, right, the possession of, of power and affluence, earthly wealth and reward while rejecting the kingdom of God, know, Jesus says, that there is only one possible outcome. And what is that? Destruction. Right? If you persist in this, in this behavior, in these actions in which you desire the elevation or the exaltation of, of self while you construct your own earthly kingdom, know that there is but one result that is to come about. There is only one outcome that is to be experienced, and that is, from the lips of Jesus, destruction. If you do not repent, Jesus says... If you do not repent, you will perish. Jesus leverages these, these cautionary tales to teach this cautionary tale. Encouraging those present to come to terms with their own personal sin and rebellion. What we understand as we consider the totality of the redeeming work of Jesus and this plan that has been set in motion by God before the foundations of the world is that this is the work of the Father in creation. Reconciliation and judgment. This is what he's doing. A cutting off for those who persist in rebellion and denial who march forward in unrighteousness outside of Christ and as a result without fruit. Look with me at verse 6 where Jesus shares this parable on the tail end of this teaching as there is a connection to be made. And he told them this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. And he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, Look, for three years now I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? Interestingly, Jesus is, is ebbing ever closer to the cross at this point. There is this cohesion between the ministry of Jesus, his movement toward the cross, and even this, this timeline that is laid forth in verses 6 through 9. Verse 7, And he said to the vine dresser, Look, for three years now I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, 
and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and put on manure. Then if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. We prayed in the beginning that from this text we would learn something about about who we are and that we would learn something about who God is and the way that he works in and through the gospel in the world, right? And so what have we learned about ourselves up until this point? I think we've learned that there is a tendency that we have to align ourselves with the practices of those referenced in the first few verses of chapter 13, right? To, To minimize our own personal sin, to the elevation of others, this, this comparability that so often takes place, whether we like are willing to be honest about our, our tendencies to do that or not. And then I think we've learned some things about, about who God is. As I think verses 6 through 9 bring you and I around the hope of the cross and the long-suffering of God. Right? This, this, this willingness, right, to... To, to, to advocate, right? The king's advocating, the vine dresser's advocating, all right, for, for, for time in which, in which there is this transformative work that is to ultimately take place. There are two great dangers before humanity. I want to touch base on both of these. I want to bring us together around a prayer, and then I want to present you with two questions. Two great dangers before humanity. This is the first. To deny Christ, resting instead in your own intellectualism as God. The first danger that is presented before you and I is the denial of Christ as we choose instead to rest in our own intellectualism as God. I think we feel that. I think we observe that. And I think we witness that in the world around us. The second is to reject one's persistent need for the cross, choosing instead to cling to self-righteousness and morality as our Savior. To reject one's persistent need for the cross, choosing instead to cling to self-righteousness and morality as a Savior. There's intentionality in the wording of this statement. And it centers on our persistent need for the cross. Because I think that if you're in this room and you identify yourself as a follower of Jesus, then you would say there is a a moment or season by which God opened your eyes to your sin and the hope that is the cross of Christ drawing us into fellowship and intimacy with him. And I think we would look back and we would go, man, in this season, the cross was such incredibly good news for my otherwise very tired and weary soul. Only something happens over time. And I think we observe it through the actions of the people of God recorded here in Luke chapter 13. We begin to, for whatever reason, disassociate ourselves from the grace that we have received from God through the cross. And we begin to hinge our righteousness on our own practices. We begin to hinge our righteousness on our own ethical or moral behavior, observing the, 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 the marks of those around us and thus distinguishing ourselves, not based on our union with Christ, but based on our ability to practice obedience and righteousness recorded in God's word. I think that is a danger, okay? That's what I'm saying. I think that that is, that is a very dangerous place to venture into. I think the encouragement then would be to like, reject our own intellectualism as God, to, to like, just stop offering like, sacrifices to, to our own heads, and to embrace our ever-present need for the redeeming work of Jesus 
in every season and moment of life. To cling to Christ, our rescuer, and not our own acts in any moment. My prayer, our prayer together, I think should be this. That we would reject both of these and celebrate instead the forgiveness that we have in the death and resurrection of Jesus. I think this is where we want to be. We want to reject intellectualism as our God. And we want, to, we want to turn from our tendency to abandon understood persistent need for the cross of Jesus. Two questions that I want to ask that I think are going to help us to come around the heart of this text, which I think centers on like sin and grace. Okay, Two questions that I want us to explore together for just a moment. I want, you to, I want you to think about these things, okay? Number one, who is the neediest person that you know spiritually? Who is the neediest person that you know? Now, we're not talking about like, man, my neighbor, he's always asking me for like cups of sugar and like gas for his mower. Like, we're not talking about that, okay? Because I am that person, and I would stand guilty and condemned, okay? So let's just uh, uh, ignore that for the time being. Who is the neediest person you know spiritually? Do you have someone in your mind? If you are at this moment considering anyone other than yourself, then you're not understanding sin correctly. I want to ask you another question. Who is the most forgiven person that you know? Who's been extended more hands of grace than you can even begin to count? Do you have someone in mind? If you're considering anyone other than yourself, then my fear is that you're not understanding God's love and the gospel correctly. There's a a well-known story of G.K. Chesterton, who some of you might be familiar with, lived many years ago. And um, and during a, a time of particular social trouble and upheaval in his community, a local newspaper ran an article in which a question was presented. And this was the question. The question was, what is wrong with the world? What is wrong with the world? Chesterton, among, among other influential individuals in the community, were asked to reply to this editorial. And so there were various responses that were, that were presented as to what is wrong with the world. But this was Chesterton's response, who loved Jesus, who loved Jesus and knew Jesus and rested in the sufficiency of the cross of Jesus. This was Chesterton's response to the question, What is wrong with the world? Chesterton wrote back and he said, Dear Mr. Editor, I am. Signed, G.K. Chesterton. (laughs) What if we approached life this way? What if we approached grace this way? What if we approached our understanding of of the gospel and its transformative effect in people this way? What would it look like for mission, man? What would it look like for mission to understand that you and I are able to, along with the Apostle Paul, identify as the chief of sinners, and yet we have observed and felt and experienced such radical transformation in our hearts and lives? What would it look like to to reflect on the grace and generosity of, of Christ 
to call us into union with the Father, and then to go out into the world believing and knowing that the gospel is able to accomplish the same work in others because it has been accomplished in you and I. Here in Luke chapter 13, as we begin this journey through Luke 13, who knows how long we'll be here, man. Let's just settle in, okay? Bring a, bring a glass of water next week. We may be here a while. As we begin, though, we see this connection back to the conclusion of chapter 12 that warns us of the dangers of the categorization of sin and the foolishness that is self-righteousness. We are a needy people. The good news is that we worship and follow a very generous God. Let's give thanks to him for the gifts that we have in his son. Father, we do love you and we are grateful. We are grateful that you have have seen fit because of who you are and because of your desires to pluck us from death and to plop us down at the table. We pray that you would keep us in this deep and profound consideration of a daily need for the cross of Christ. Understood sin and celebration of the resurrection. We thank you that we follow a good king who persists in the pursuit of a people. Sending the Spirit to transform our hearts and to draw us together in union with you and in union with one another. Help us as we close out our time today to celebrate well as we take of the bread and the cup, remembering the sufficiency of Jesus' sacrifice to purchase forgiveness for sinful people. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. I want you to take your Lord's Supper and, um, and begin to prepare the elements. If you don't have one, you can um, venture over here to the table to, to grab one. We, of course, have two elements that are, that are here that are represented, the bread and, uh, and the cup. We're going to read this week from Matthew chapter 26, beginning in verse 26. And we're going to read through verse 28, where we find the institution of this supper and the emphasis that Christ places upon it. Thus informing the way in which we participate, our hearts and our minds, the things that we think and the things that we feel as we do so. Matthew chapter 26, beginning in verse 26, Matthew writes, Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread And after blessing it, he broke it. He broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Now as we hold the bread, I want us to to remember in light of what we read here that this is indeed symbolic of the body of Christ that has been has been torn to pieces on the cross for you, securing forgiveness and this new intimate relationship with the Father. The body of Christ broken for you. I want you to eat it. Now I want you to take the cup. And as we drink, I want us to remember that this is symbolic of the spilt blood of of Jesus, which not mixes with the sacrifices offered in the temple, but transcends them. Blood that speaks of, of forgiveness, as it has been spilt for you and I. And I want you to drink it. Amen. We're going to take just a couple of minutes and we're going, to, uh, we're going to continue to celebrate and to reflect and to meditate on the hope of the gospel and all that it means for our lives and our engagement 
in the lives of those around us. If you need to take a moment and to talk with a friend about application or what it looks like to, um, to follow after Jesus, this is the time to do that as we, as we respond. We give gifts to support the work of gospel ministry in our community and beyond. We meditate on these truths. We listen to the words that are sung as we prepare ourselves to join our vo- vo- voices in just a few moments.
Uh, so please grab one before you go. And then second, just a quick reminder that we have a uh, book club tomorrow night here at 730. So if you plan on attending that, we'd love for you to join. We'll have coffee and conversation around the Wisdom Pyramid. Um, I'm going to read our closing prayer for us, and then we'll sing the doxology together. Grant us, Lord God, the vision of your kingdom, forgiveness and new life, and the stirring of your spirit, so that we may share your vision Proclaim your love and change this world in the name of Christ. Amen. All right, let's sing the doxology together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above. Great Mother's Day and a wonderful week. You guys are all dismissed.
forget to know.